There we go. <laughs> Hello all, I'm Natalie Richards, the Adult Education Coordinator for Sturgeon Village Museum, and welcome to our first lecture in our Juneteenth speaker series, The Significance of Juneteenth in History and the Present. Sturgeon Village is a department of the Eastern States Exposition, um, home of the Big E Fair. Um, ESC is a not-for-profit organization committed to agriculture, education, history, industry, family entertainment, and the preservation of New England history. We're grateful for your participation today, whether virtually or in person, um, at our summer solstice celebration event. This lecture will be recorded and available for viewing on our website, www.storytonvillage.com. And we want to thank Springfield Technical Community College for their assistance in publicizing this event, and especially Vanetta Lightfoot, Operations Manager from the Stick Multicultural Affairs Department for enthusiastically supporting this new collaboration. Thank you, Vanetta. Um, I'd now like to introduce you to our speaker, J. Anthony Guillory, PhD, teaches courses at Springfield Technical Community College in American History, African American History, and African American Literature. Guillory's first dissertation project explores the development of physical culture um, initiatives within African American communal spaces along the East Coast between 1900 and 1920. Guillory's service work goal is to empower communities through informed engagement. Guillory currently resides in Dallas, Texas after six years in Massachusetts and continues as an adjunct professor of English and history while also earning a second doctoral degree at the University of Texas Arlington. We ask that everyone um, remains on mute during the lecture. However, at the end, we will open up for questions. If you have any questions during the presentation, I will be monitoring the chat box and we'll refer to those at the end of the lecture and give those to Anthony. Um, thank you and welcome Dr. Guillory. Thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Small correction. Uh, I worked at Stick full time for six years, but I was in Massachusetts for 10 years. And that's significant because when I moved back to the state of Texas, evidently my accent changed. And now everywhere I go, one of the first questions I'm asked is, are you from here? Right. Uh, so you hear a Southern draw, no doubt. Um, but according to these uh, Texas natives, uh, I sound funny, um, but uh, never mind that. Um, good morning. I'm um, honored to be here with you. Again, uh, Massachusetts was my home for a very long time. As a matter of fact, I'll share this with you. So I moved every year from age 16 to 26. I grew up in an impoverished state, a great deal of familial instability. And so it was only in Massachusetts right, at the age of 26 that I was able to secure long-term housing. Um, so for me, Massachusetts is going to be home and it's always gonna have a special place in my heart because it was the first time I could unpack boxes and leave them there for several years. Um, additionally, my daughter was born there, um, bless her heart. Uh, Giovanni Ashe was born at Bay State Medical uh, September 26, uh, 2016. So um, I will always have a, uh, a, a special place in my heart for not only Massachusetts, but Springfield uh, especially. Uh, so like I said, I really appreciate this opportunity to engage you. Um, the topic on the table is Juneteenth. Um, I, I, I promise you that I never consider having this conversation uh, on a national stage um, where in which people outside of Texas who do not have cultural origins in the state would even care what the holiday is. This is a very peculiar moment for me. Um, I'll take it, right? Um, anytime that I can, you know, spread um, information uh, where I can spotlight or highlight the ways in which Texas history and Texas African American history is US history or significant or significant to people outside of the state, I'll definitely take it. Um, but this is no doubt a very surreal moment. And I'll get into that uh, towards the end of my presentation. What I want to do in the time that we have together 
is to unpack the history of Juneteenth. I want to unpack the um, I want to unpack the history leading up to June 19, 1865. Um, and hopefully, right, by doing so, I can help to explain the significance of the holiday here in Texas, uh, the significance of the holiday um, uh, for the country, right? Um, while also addressing some of the things that I know are being said about Juneteenth um, that cast it in a very, particularly a, a very negative light. Um, I'm not a Texas apologist. Um, I'll say that out the gate, right? I do not bracket myself as such. Um, many of your perceptions of Texas as being backwards are correct. Uh, <laughs> but in saying that, um, what I, I hope to do is to provide a, a counter narrative to how we understand uh, the state and how we understand the history involving the state um, and the implications for US history, okay? So let me begin with the perceptions of uh, the holiday, uh, perceptions of the Emancipation Proclamation, which is what Juneteenth actually commemorates. Juneteenth commemorates the reading of the EP uh, to an enslaved population in Galveston, Texas. Um, and it's in the it's in that history, right, that we have many of the misconceptions of Juneteenth and that we have misconceptions about African American history uh, in Texas. Um, and then I also think we have because of that, we have misconceptions about or mis misinter misinterpretations of the history of the Civil War, right, and what it actually did, right. I think all of these things are linked. But the history of the Emancipation Proclamation is very Union Army centric. Um, we know history is written by the winners. Um, this interpretation, no doubt, right, um, is um, an example of that. And what I mean by that is when we talk about the EP, we often say that, that the EP, 1863, is when enslaved African people in the United States became free. That's not true. Um, we talk, when we talk about the EP, right, um, some people will go so far as to say that the enslaved people, right, in the Confederate States became free. That's not true. Um, we also then will talk about, right, the EP um, as freeing the people. Um, yeah, we also talk about the EP arriving in 1863 and therefore Juneteenth, which is commemorate, which commemorates uh, the uh, reading of the EP in 1865, right? As African-Americans finding out that they were free um, as, and then they then cast this conversation about emancipation in this field of education or the lack thereof uh, or the ignorance of these people. And the problem of that perception of these enslaved people being ignorant of the war, of the EP, of their emancipation, right, has this residual effect that then feeds into, right, if not creating stereotypes of the Black Southerner as intellectually inferior, not only to his white counterpart, but also to other people in other regions of the country, race notwithstanding. What I will suggest is that we should reconsider this history from a different perspective, from a different point of view. And that doing so will help us to understand why African American people, right, uh, were still in bondage in Galveston in 1865, right? Uh, but it also helped to, uh, help us to appreciate um, the efforts to manumit themselves or to free themselves that are taking place right, well before this period. Just to give you an illustration of what we mean by this Eurocentric or Union-centric uh, perspective, um, I recall the history um, uh, written by Stephen Hahn, who looks at the African-Americans who uh, freed themselves by going to Union lines, 
who were taken in by the Union Army and then by way of the Emancipation Proclamation were allowed to serve in the Union Army. Um, Stephen Hahn says that historians operating from this Union centric point of view neglect or fail to consider the impact, right? The meaning of these armed African Americans who once they pick up arms and then turn those barrels towards the Confederacy in the eyes of the Confederate States were engaged in an act of rebellion. They were engaged in an insurrection, an armed insurrection. And if we think about it from that point of view, African Americans who had formerly had been enslaved, who escaped to the Union Army, who then took up arms against the Confederate Army, right? Therefore, they engaged in what could be considered the largest and most successful slave insurrection in the United States. We don't often talk about it in those terms, right? We, in our union centric point of view, don't acknowledge the Confederate States as an actual country. And that's a problem. We also don't consider the fact that as an actual country, they had their own constitution, right? Um, they had their own set of laws and they had their own perspectives. Um, their perspectives, right, regarding the Emancipation Proclamation is probably most important. When we say that Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in January 1863, freeing the enslaved people in, in, in the rebel territories, they call themselves the Confederate States of America, a separate country. The problem is a member of the executive branch of one country cannot free the slaves of another country except through military action. Again, the executive of a one country, right, cannot simply offer an edict freeing the enslaved population of another country. Therefore, the EP in the eyes of the Confederacy meant nothing. It meant nothing so long as the Union Army, right, was on the other side of the Mason-Dixon line. That's critical because what that tells us then is right when we ask this conversation of did the Emancipation Proclamation free enslaved people, the question, the answer, right, is like, well, no, not really. It, it didn't, right? And what I say that, right, I'm suggesting that we look at the material conditions, okay? We look at right, not only the statement of freedom, but the way in which people were able to then act out on that freedom. And what we see is, right, when we look at the material conditions, there wasn't really no way to exercise that freedom unless the Union Army was there to secure those freedoms, or at least to keep the enslaved, excuse me, keep the slaveholding uh, population from um, re-enslaving those people who had escaped uh, to find their own freedom. We have to remember that the original goal of the Civil War was not to free enslaved people. That was not the goal. The goal, as, Amer as Abraham Lincoln articulated, was to restore the Union. Several people called for him to free the enslaved population all right, in the earlier years of the war, and he refused. He wanted nothing to do with that. Um, eventually, he will be moved to, uh, to free the enslaved population. And in doing so, right, he, or excuse me, and by doing so, he frees this enslaved population as a war tactic. Rationale being, if we free this population, right, they will not be able to contribute to the war effort in, you know, either digging trenches or, um, you know, uh, transporting supplies. Um, or in some cases, right, uh, operating in some other form of defense or even, you know, um, uh, engaging in spying or something like that. If we took this out of the equation, it would then weaken the Confederacy. At least that was the rationale. Certainly there were African-Americans who were proponents of freeing the enslaved population and they were proponents of uh, arming African-Americans, right? But we have to understand that Lincoln had his own mind about this um, and that his ideas on African-Americans, their participation in the war, and then what they would become once freed evolved over time. The limitations of the Emancipation Proclamation was something we don't often discuss, but we should. Uh, the slave states that did not succeed, did not secede from the union were not 
impacted. Kentucky, Missouri, Delaware, uh, Maryland, they did not secede and therefore they did not have to give up their slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation. Those slave states who were already under union control at the time that the Emancipation Proclamation was uh, issued, they didn't have to give up their slaves either. Again, the effort was not to free the slaves. Right, the effort was to secure, right, or to re to 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 resecure the union. And then finally, we have to consider that the freedom promised by the EP, right, was predicated on the condition that the union successfully defeated the con the Confederate army. Right, at the time, we were very very far out. Okay, we there was no clear victor in 1863. Right, therefore. Right, it was merely words, right? And you know, they were motivating words and they were captivating words, right? But in terms of the material conditions, the EP did very little to actually free the enslaved population, right? What is taking place during this time, and I'll speak to this in a minute, right? Is that African Americans are involved in the work of freeing themselves. And they had been involved in the work of freeing themselves by both legal and extra legal means, all right? And I'll refer to that, I'll get back to that in a second. So this conception of Juneteenth, right, and the late arrival of the so-called news of freedom, let's let's address that. Uh, we know, right, those of us who have done some homework on the holiday know that um, Juneteenth commemorates the day that Major General Gordon Granger uh, arrived in Galveston to read the EP and to to discuss how it applied to uh, the people of Galveston to the people of Texas. Uh, the Union Army had successfully expanded into Texas. They, they set up a, uh, a headquarters there, right? Um, and then they dispatched Union, uh, Union, Union Army uh, soldiers throughout, you know, throughout the state, right? The day before Granger arrived, right, his soldiers actually arrived to secure the space, right? Speaking to my idea, right, that unless there was a Union, um, a union victory and unless union soldiers can work to secure that freedom that it did not actually mean anything. Um, the, the EP, according to Granger, uh, provided for equal protection of African Americans property rights and personal rights. Okay, it changed the nature of the relationship between the enslaver and the enslaved from uh, to employer and employee. But it also directed in, uh, formerly enslaved people to remain on the plantations and work for wages. It also prevented formerly enslaved people from leaving those plantations and then going to military um, um, military posts, right? And then seeking to find asylum uh, or refugee status there. It is those limitations of the Emancipation Proclamation as read to the people of Galveston Right, that will foreshadow the struggle for civil, labor, and economic rights of African Americans would endure for generations that follow. So, this perception that the formerly enslaved found out that they were free roughly two years later, right, um, it's not only predicated on this union centric understanding of the war um, and the history, right, it's just flat out inaccurate. In my second PhD <laughs> graduate studies, I'm in I'm engaged in transatlantic um, African American African and Africa African Af African American Afro Caribbean and African connection uh, excuse me social communal economic networks and what we find when we do these studies is that African American people on the mainland are engaged with communities of African people in the Gulf of Mexico, and they are engaged with communities in the Caribbean. These country, these people in these respective locales are not isolated. And what, what that means is news travels, right? Because of shipping, right, um, of commodities, right? The shipping of, you know, cash crops, right? Um, news travels quickly, rather quickly. So, right, the idea, that the enslaved population in Galveston was somehow cut off or isolated from the inf information about the war, excuse me, about Lincoln's presidency, about the war, 
all right, um, and about the implications of the war and the rumors surrounding that, all right, to suggest such a thing as a farce, all right, it's historically unverifiable, all right. What is actually the case, right, um, and what I would argue is that this enslaved population was very well aware of Lincoln. They were very well aware of the war. And they were very well aware that the disorder and the chaos brought about with the war moment could mean their emancipation. So by the time that Granger shows up, these African-Americans had already crafted their meaning of freedom. They had already begun to do the work, right, of coalition building, right, pooling of resources, devising schemes and plans to develop community, right? They were already doing that work. Stephen Hahn writes in Nation Under Our Feet, right, that the mobilization for these political, right, um, political activism that we see during Reconstruction, it doesn't have its, its beginnings during the Reconstruction moment, right? And it's actually ridiculous to suggest that, right? It feeds a narrative of the ignorant enslaved African, right, um, disrupting American politics, right? Um, that is, you know, uh, emphasized in the film Birth of a Nation, right, to suggest such a thing. What is more likely to have happened is these people had developed these ideas of freedom. They had developed these ideas of self-determination, right? They had already developed these ideas about education and legitimate, uh, legitimacy of their families and um, economic independence, right? They had already crafted these ideas while they were still legally enslaved and they just brought them with them, right? Into freedom, they brought them with them, right? During the reconstruction moment. And then they then developed from there, okay? Another thing to consider when we talk about the late arrival of this news, right? Um, I remember one of my professors at UMass Amherst, uh, I won't call him out, bless his heart. Um, he said to me one day, this very off the cuff, very insensitive thing um, regarding Juneteenth, that we were silly to commemorate the holiday because we had been free, right, for over two years, right? And we were the only country, we were the only group of people in the country who celebrated this. But let's look at the dates. We know Juneteenth, all right? June 19, 1865, we know that, right? But do we know that Robert E. Lee surrendered in April of 1865, which meant that these people would have found out about their freedom without like two months after the fact, okay? Um, the 13th Amendment was passed in January of 1865, but it wasn't ratified until December of 1865. And we understand that executive orders are temporary. Right, we seen a few presidents right use the executive order recently, um, and those things can be struck down. Those things can be right challenged in court, right? Um, and there are other branches of government that can just flat out tell you, no, that's not going to work, right? So, despite the limitations of the EP that I mentioned earlier, it's important to note that at any point, Congress could have come back and said, no, nah, we're not going to do that. At any point, the Supreme Court could have come back and said, no, nah, no, nah, we don't support that. So again, it, yes, the 13th Amendment was, was passed by Congress in January of 1865, but it wasn't ratified until December, right? The end of the year. Those states I mentioned to you earlier that did not secede from the Union, right? And therefore weren't affected by the EP, right? Slavery did not end in 1863 in those spaces, right? Maryland was the first to abolish slavery um, in 1864, but Missouri abolished slavery January 11, 1865. And then Delaware and Kentucky actually didn't abolish slavery until December of 1865, after Juneteenth. So in that way, right? you know, it's unfair, as well as historically inaccurate, to look to Texas, right, the backwards Negroes in Texas, and say that they found out about their freedom much later. Because, and this is important to note, right, without law, right, without law, 
and military action to support that law or to enforce that law, it does not alter one's material conditions. Now it's important to note, Juneteenth does not actually celebrate the end of African-American enslavement. As I mentioned earlier, African-Americans had been manumitting, right? They had been manumitted by, the, by their former slave masters. They had been manumitting themselves, right? Well before this time. It celebrates the day that <clears throat> the Union Army arrives in Galveston, right? And reads the Emancipation Proclamation, Proclamation and then can actually enforce the, uh, the, the executive order. That's what it commemorates, all right? The history of emancipation, right, is much longer and right? took on many more forms. Those legal efforts to uh, secure their freedom um, by African-Americans came by way of freedom suits, where in which African-Americans would literally sue for their freedom. This dates back to the 1700s, where in which you see Africans as well as African-American people who will petition the court for freedom, invoking either their, their Christian identity, right, or tropes of American freedom or American liberty as the justification for manumission. Extra legal efforts include traversing through what we know as the Underground Railroad, right, from Southern spaces to Northern spaces, right? Uh, and those Northern spaces include Canada after the, um, the uh, Fugitive Slave Clause of 1850. Um, but it's also important to note that in some instances, depending on geography, it was easier for African-Americans to escape West, right? Or to escape South, past the Rio Grande into Mexico. I am being seduced by the topic of exploring Afro-Mexican, uh, excuse me, uh, Afro-Mexican um, or Afro-Texan and Afro-Mexican relationships regarding emancipation, right? And the way in which Mexico becomes this refuge for African-Americans who are seeking um, better material conditions with respect to their civil rights and their economic opportunities, all right? I might do it, um, but I should probably do this urban history of, of Dallas, but we'll see, I'll keep you posted. Anyway, Juneteenth is one of many emancipation days in US history. As African-Americans secure their freedom in large scale, right? Communities will then celebrate that. We see many of these emancipation days, right? Following the American Revolution. Um, Juneteenth just so happens to be among the most popular emancipation days of the Civil War period, but it wasn't the only one. Um, did y'all know that Massachusetts has its own emancipation day? Did y'all know that uh, last year, <laughs> Two senators uh, from the uh, two state senators actually introduced legislation uh, to or a resolution rather to make Quark Walker Day the official Massachusetts Emancipation Day. Quark Walker had been an enslaved African person of mixed race heritage. We need to note that, right? Um, there are several instances of African Americans in, who are who have both African as well as Native American. Um, uh, ethnic origins, and Quark Walker was one of these people, and he was promised his freedom um, by his uh, former enslavers, um, but that freedom didn't come. And so, at, at age 28, he decided to self-manumit. He just decided he was done. He was done. He was done being a slave. His former enslaver challenged that, and then beat him, beat him mercilessly. Walker survived, went to court sued his former uh, master for uh, battery and the jury ruled that Walker was a free man. The case was appealed. It goes to the, uh, the state Supreme Court and, in, in, and from that court ruling, the state Supreme Court ruled that slavery was unconstitutional according to Massachusetts law. Two senators from your state in uh, last year uh, working on behalf of a group that had already been um, mobilizing uh, to have Quark Walker Day acknowledged, 
um, introduced this resolution to the Senate and it passed unanimously. Y'all don't have to celebrate Juneteenth. Y'all got y'all's own day. You also have your own history of slavery. It's important to understand or to think about why we don't talk about that very often, because we should. Let's look at the tenets of Juneteenth. Why people celebrate it? What does it mean? I would argue that in order to understand the significance of Juneteenth, we need to look at the historical moment. We need to look at the concerns of Black folk on the ground during that time. And what we do, when we do look at these Black folk and when we do look at these people and their expressions of freedom during this moment, we see that they are struggling to re, uh, locate family. They are struggling to legitimate their relationships, including their marriages, right, through courts. They are struggling to acquire land and to create community. They are struggling to establish schools, to learn trades, and to create economic self, uh, self-sufficiency. They are struggling to secure the franchise. They want to actually be American citizens. We have to understand that the Emancipation Proclamation did not make these people free, nor did it make them citizens. The 13th Amendment, sure, it abolished slavery, except for punishment of a crime, which we can speak to, right? But it did not make these people citizens. You can say that the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause made them citizens, but it did not give them the franchise. And what I think is significant to note as far as African-American history, as well as those who are engaged in women's suffrage history, is unless you have the ballot, unless you have a voice within a democracy, I would argue you're not a citizen. You're a ward. You're somebody we take care of. We're somebody that we account for, but if you don't have a voice inside the democracy, then how can you call yourself a citizen? That to me, I think has implications for right the current moment when we talk about right the legislation to make it more difficult for people to vote to register to vote and then to stay registered to vote right but we can talk about that if you'd like during the q a another thing that we see that these people struggle with was to create self or autonomy with respect to religious observance churches were erected Right, you saw open displays of traditional African religion. Right, those who had been Muslim when they arrived, or whose families had been Muslim when they arrived in North America, right, who had practiced Islam underground, right, were able to do so openly now. Right, and I would argue that those struggles, right, uh, to create an African American life should be the focus of Juneteenth. Those are the things that I think that we should observe if we observe Juneteenth. The implications for the holiday in our current time. If we look at this history, if we look at it carefully, right? If we look, for, look at it for lessons, right? To teach us for the current moment, <coughs> excuse me. We see this link to civil rights. We see this link to voting. We see this link to um, the right to contracts, right? Including marriage as uh, marriage contracts, right? Um, when we look at this, we see this link to land acquisition, right? And land acquisition is not simply to have land, it's to generate wealth from that land, it's to generate economic independence from that land, right? And when we look at this, we see this link to labor rights, right? It's not simply, right, like, again, the EP says that these people have to remain on the plantation and work as employees. They have to be wage earners. But what would happen if this African-American man, this African-American woman said, no, nah, I want to go and work on my own land, right? When this African-American woman, right, in this very simple but very impactful expression of freedom says, I don't want to work in these white people's kitchen. I want to go work in my own kitchen. Or I want to negotiate for a higher rate, a higher wage. Right? What does it mean when she says that? What does it mean when she's met with resistance? 
right? One of the things that we can look at if we interrogated this, and this speaks to this other implication, which is the criminal justice system, is the convict leasing system, which has gotten more attention um, in light of Michelle Alexander's research on criminal justice reform. Um, but before her, there was Douglas Blackman who, writes, who wrote Slavery by Another Name. But well before them, right, the Crisis Magazine had published um, several articles about the convict leasing system, right, in the contemporary moment. But the, crisis, the convict leasing system was a loophole to the 13th Amendment that allowed people who had been incarcerated to be forced into unpaid manual labor, right? And so we know full well about the black men who were uh, victims of the convict leasing system, right? Who were found on the street being vagrants, right? Loitering is what we call it today, right? Or if they had walked off of a plantation and said, I'm not gonna work here anymore, right? Um, if they broke some other, right? Um, or if they had disrupted or challenged the racial caste system in another way, they can be put in jail, right? Fined, and because they were poor, they could not pay it and therefore they were put in jail, right? And what the convict leasing system allows for is a private citizen or a corporation to go in, pay this person's fine, and that person would then be right given to, right? The private citizen or to the corporation to then work off that fine, right? In terms set by, the private citizen or the corporation. And that allows for the continuation of slavery, right? It allows for a continuation of slavery at a much cheaper rate, right? Because during the slave, during the time that slavery was legal, the value of an individual slave, right, would rival that of a house, even in today's market. Right? So what that meant is you would only expose the enslaved person to certain types of work. But under the convict leasing system, their value was merely that of their fine, $3, $5, $7, $10, which meant now you could expose them to a type of work that is much more dangerous because the only thing you would lose if they got killed is the amount you paid for the fine. Here's why this is important. Here's why this is significant. During slavery, because of the value of the slave and the value of the slave being such that we would not expose the African to certain types of dangerous work, but that work still existed, that meant that other groups had to do that work. Well, who's that other group? Poor European Americans were that other group. Poor immigrants from Europe were that other group, right? And so the reason why we have the large influx, or one of the reasons why we have the large influx of European immigrants to Northern spaces that would eventually alter the political map that would then lead to the civil war is because the value that we placed on slaves was such that only that the most horrendous work was reserved for these poor whites and these European Americans. And people wrote home saying, do not go south. They're gonna have you in a mine somewhere. They're gonna have you blowing up something, right? Go north, cast your, like, cast your luck there. And that is why we have, right? That is one of the bigger reasons why we have such a large influx of these people to these northern spaces, which again will ch will will change the political mapping, will change right the, the 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 distribution of representatives, right? Taking political power away from the South, that will then make them uncomfortable. And so when Lincoln arrives in 1860, 1860, they're like, nope, we're out, we gotta go, because at that point, because of the large numbers in those spaces, right, northern spaces who were anti-slavery, right, those southern states felt like the institution would be under attack. But again, going back to the convict leasing system, that was not the case anymore. And so these people were now disposable, right? Just as valuable, right? Just to, you know, the, 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 the reputation of being hardworking was just, it, it was, it was there too, at least in terms of being sought after labor, right? But now you could expose them to that, right? And if they decided they wanted to revolt, kill them. There was nothing that makes you, there was nothing to keep you tied to this person. They either worked for you, right? Or you could expel them, right? That's the that's what the convict leasing system allowed for. All right. So again, so you have this link to civil rights, you have this, um, excuse me, to labor rights, you have this link to the criminal justice reform. And so when we look at the holiday, right, there's several things we can focus on, right? We can look at both, right, the struggles on the ground at the time, we can look at the implications, right? But what we cannot do 
is reconcile where we are with the holiday being nationally recognized. At the same time, we see a challenge to our voting laws. At the same time, we see a challenge to what we can be, what can be taught in our public school systems and call this a good day. We cannot reconcile it in those terms because Juneteenth does not represent what we are seeing in this historical moment. Going back to the holiday, right? So we should note that Juneteenth is the first, right? Um, legal state, excuse me, legally recognized Emancipation Day holiday. It's the first. It came in 1979. The historical, the historical moment of 1979 was such that we had um, a continuation of Jim Crow, right? It, it was it still persisted, right? Several places had desegregated, right? But economic and uh, political political inequality still persisted. Gender inequality still persisted. Um, housing discrimination still existed. We saw urban unrest, right? It was in that moment that Juneteenth became a state, uh, a state recognized holiday or a legal uh, holiday here in the state of Texas. The, where we are now is Juneteenth, right? We should know this, right? Juneteenth, or at least the effort to establish Juneteenth as a national holiday, this is not brand new. This has been here. There's a mo there's mobilization for this type of work, right? Uh, to do this type of thing uh, going back several years. Um, it passes this year. It goes through this year. It goes through in the aftermath of George Floyd's public extra legal execution. Just because that man was a cop does not mean that he, it was, he was allowed to kill this man in the street, particularly through the means that he did. So it was extra legal. Another way of calling it an extra legal execution is to call it a lynching. That is the moment that we see this holiday. Again, we see this attack on critical race theory. We see this attack on, um, yeah, we see this attack on people's, um, you know, voter, uh, you know, their ability to vote. Um, either by way of voter suppression, right, which is the spreading of misinformation, right, uh, or disenfranchisement, where in which we're saying, for whatever reason, you're now ineligible to vote. Um, that is the moment we're in. Um, those people who were present at the, uh, the very public spectacle of signing Juneteenth into law the other day were very quick to point out, like, this is not this is not a, a stamp of arrival, right? We're not done yet, right? They, most of those people who were interviewed, right? Acknowledged the current historical moment and the issues that we have, right? Um, and they gave credence to those who don't view this holiday as particularly significant. They gave credence to those who don't view this holiday as um, a, re a response or at least an appropriate response to the demands following George Floyd's death. Um, and so, as I will always say, right, to those who are detractors of the, the holiday uh, because of historical inaccuracies that they're flawed, right, I cannot easily dismiss this group of people who are saying that because of what we're doing in the country, and because of what's happening in the country, and because we are revisiting many of these themes from our past, right, that um, it is inappropriate then, right, to point to something like Juneteenth, right, um, and call this an example of progress, right. I can't, I can't dismiss them. I have to, I have to, I have to give them the space to operate because they're not wrong. And my argument is if we look at what the holiday commemorated on the ground at the time, and if we look at the implications of the holiday, right, in our own time, in our present moment, right, there are many things that have yet to have been secured um, that we need to address. And so for those of you who are listening, who have an interest in Juneteenth, who will want to celebrate it, who want to observe it, rather than 
adopting these piecemeal representations of blackness that speak to cultural appropriation rather than right defining emancipation day on your own terms right i would urge you to consider what it is and what it meant on the ground for these people at the time all right and then i want you to look for similarities between other communities right in the south but also in northern spaces on the ground at the time and i would also ask you to consider right the relevance of these struggles the relevance of this observance the relevance of this celebration right um for your own time um i think then we can understand and appreciate the significance of juneteenth and i think that's probably the only way to do it all right that concludes my presentation um hopefully i was clear i can't see y'all y'all didn't you know I see my 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 extended family there, Smith family. God bless you. I love you. Um, and then there's my brother John Diffley. Um, but otherwise, I don't know if y'all are paying attention or not. So please let me know through your Q and A, right? If this if this made sense. Thank you so much for your presentation, uh, Dr. Guillory. I think you did a wonderful job, and I'm so grateful to have you here at the museum today. Um, at this time, virtually or in person, we'll take you anyway. <laughs> um, at this time, I want to open the chat and our um, in-person audience up to questions um, following that. Uh, additionally, if you are on Zoom, you can use the raise your hand feature to uh, prompt us to call on you to answer your questions. So I'm going to look through the chat and see. Some very kind words for you there. Oh, um, <laughs> and if anyone at this time would like to raise their hands or ask a question, you are more than welcome to. Additionally, do I have any questions from my audience here? No. All right. I'll just say hi, Anthony. It's Eric and I. Hey, Amy. How you doing? <laughs> so you do have some support here in Mass. <laughs> And I'll just give it a few minutes, see if we get any additional questions. Um, I also want to invite all of you who are joining us via Zoom for um, a panel presentation with some other speakers at 1 p.m. Eastern time that will happen here through the museum once again. Oh, hi, Anthony, how are you doing? I'm well, Eric, how are you, brother? <laughs> how do you feel about baseball's decision to move the All-Star game? I, I think it was appropriate. Um, I think that it's appropriate for a couple of reasons. I think that it fits with the 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 current the current climate. Um, I think that it's a a bold move. Certainly, I, there's there's no way to anticipate s such a large entity like MLB making such a move. Um, and I think that the reaction that we saw. Um, by like you know Governor Abbott uh, here in Texas, right? Um, to pick on him, I think that that illustrates the significance of that, um, where in which you you know these this such a large entity is linking civil rights um, with uh, its economic prowess, and um, what I would say, Eric, is that. In our ultra capitalist economy, money talks, right? Um, the Supreme Court ruled that you know money is speech, and I would argue that if we want to see that, let, let me say this: I would argue that we will be seeing substantive change when we see other corporate entities, right, operating on such a large scale, right throwing their political convictions, right? Um, you know, or excuse me, supporting their political convictions with the uh, with their economic prowess, either in what they find, either what they what they patronize or what they don't, what they sponsor and what they don't. I think that that's where we are. Does that help? That's great. Thank you. Wonderful response. Thank you for your question. I've had mixed feelings about that too. Interesting hearing how you felt. Tell me what you think. 
Well, I, I, I for the, the idea that they're making a stand against the uh, oppressive law is great. On the other hand, I wonder about the businesses around Atlanta. Are you hurting a lot of uh, minority businesses that have been making tons of money from the All-Star Game since mm -hmm. Atlanta has quite a few African-American businesses? So I had mixed feelings. No, I get that. And, and, and that's, that's important. And I appreciate you for being empathetic in that way. Um, so what we're operating under is the, the boycott model, right? Um, and this was a component of the civil rights movement that I would argue contemporary activists fail to understand. Um, it's basically caused disruption in the economic system right, uh, to invoke change. And a key difference between now and the civil rights era of the 1960s is the number of African-American businesses who can be impacted by this. Um, but I would also argue, Eric, that it is a byproduct of an economic war, honestly. It's a battle. Um, and so, you know, I, I look, I certainly can, you know, can, can, can appreciate that perspective, but I guess what it looks like they've done is they've calculated that such would be a, you know, um, justifiable byproduct, if you will, um, of this larger, this larger stance, right? Um, but you're right though, like there's no way to get around the fact that other businesses that depended on the All-Star game that could have benefited from the All-Star game um, and it being there, right? They, um, they're certainly hurt by that. Oh, thank you for your perspective. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for yours. I appreciate it. Um, I see a, thank you. Um, I see a raised hand from a Christian Smith, if you would like to ask your question. Um, and then I do see a question in the chat or a comment. We'll address that after. I know these beautiful people. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Anthony, uh, this is this was really uh, this was really special, man. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just appreciative of it. Um, I just always respect your your uh, your knowledge and and mm -hmm. and your passion for liberating your people, you know, mm -hmm. and liberating yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I just. I, I'm just take I'm just taking it all in. I'm very appreciative of it because I feel like uh, my our existence here is in, in this in this country is 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 and always has been like you have to you you have to understand for yourself and for your family what this stuff what what whatever is put out to you you right. have to process it for for your 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 family totally uh, for your people because mm -hmm. whatever is out there is not what it is sure. you, you know right. you know and so it's and so and so i appreciate the perspective you know thinking about what was happening for for black people at that time yeah because mm -hmm. that feels really um yeah. that 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 feels like something that i want to i mean i think about anyway but i want to be thinking about that at this time i want to talk i want to teach my kids Absolutely. about that you know and mm -hmm. and because the the parallel right. thinking about what was there going on for them and right. what it's like for us right now and Absolutely. and it, it's this it's 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 the same thing it's just yeah, like yeah. you know right mm -hmm. i agree i totally yeah. agree yeah go yeah. ahead Jimmy. anthony i mean always somebody put in the comments illuminating always the conversation with you is always that and uh, I really am appreciative because I guess too for me um this is helpful because we're raising kids I'm from the Caribbean yep. Christians experiences here as black in America the mainland right. Right. and sometimes it's hard for me to reconcile some of those things because I I push like I'll say okay it's Juneteenth but I know my people emancipated in 1848 in the right, Caribbean, right, right. right? And so it's always that disconnect of, right? Like sure, sure. in the Virgin Islands, it was 1848, right, you know, right. when we have our own emancipation. So it just, just understanding that and how yeah. each place has its own, I haven't really placed that before. And right, exactly. uh, that exactly. just really helps. And then I actually wanted your thoughts too. Um, when you talked about, if you don't have the right to vote, you're just a ward. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a whole piece in, in criminal justice about that. 
But I also feel that very personally as being a Virgin Islander. So you're a U.S. territory, mm -hmm. right? Yep. With no right to vote right. for yep. the president. Yep. And so that one hit in a mm. different way to think of my people as wards yep. of this country yep. still, yep. despite the fact that we emancipated ourselves that long ago. So I just was interested in your thoughts mm. on that. And the whole idea too, about like the fact that people didn't hear in Texas, I'm like, they heard of the Haitian revolution. That's the, that's the point. That's why right, they were right, afraid. Right. There were people right, revolting right. everywhere. Yeah. That's what yeah. made them move to that. So that whole narrative of like, they hadn't heard, it just, I really appreciate yes, that. Cause yes, it, it just starts to put things together, right? Like, oh, right. So right. I don't know. You know what's funny, Janae? That that narrative is dominant here. Yeah. I have family members that, you know, you know, though they lie to us. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? They lie, right? But it's them, however they interpreted that false narrative, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're, you know, they're bringing it forward and you know, and they're they're acting out on a political stance and you want to respect mm -hmm. it, but at the same time, it's like it's just not true. Mm -hmm. right? it's, just, it's, just, it's not the case, right? It wasn't about. Right, like the, people literally think that they could have just walked off the plantation, as if nobody was gonna stop them. Mm. <laughs> like, you know, like it's 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 a right. weird thing that, like, you know, like oh, well, you know, what well, they had been free, like, according to who, <laughs> right? Like, right. you know, um, it's just like any other law, right? I mean, laws, laws take enforcement, mm. right? And so, and we could, you know, if we could to expand this conversation or extend this conversation forward, we have the 14th, 15th Amendment, right? But if nobody's there on the ground to enforce the 14th and 15th Amendment, <laughs> then what does that say about your actual material conditions as a citizen? Sure, mm -hmm. you can vote on paper, but good luck going to the ballot, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like that's, that's significant to me. Um, Going back to the the the, the discourse uh, or the the rhetorical choice of Ward, um, yeah. So the Virgin Islands, right? Uh, Puerto Rico, right? Um, you know where they have a relationship with the United States that does not grant them right access to all the liberties, right? That 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 people on the mainland enjoy. And speaking specifically to the Virgin Islands, right? So without that vote. Right, then how then are you supposed to understand your relationship to the mother country? Right. And I say mother country invoking this language of colonialism because we cannot separate America's history from its imperial history. And it is still very much an imperialist organization. Right. Um, and so what that tells us is the amount of work we have left to do and what we have left to accomplish. Um, you know, if, if we're not talking statehood, right, for these spaces, right, then, okay, then, you know, what are we willing to admit is the colonial relationship? Hmm. Um, so, you know, yeah, that was very deliberate, that use of word, because I want, I want us to think about something. Mm-hmm. You know, because, you know, like, so, like someone asked me, I worked in the school district here for a bit, and some kid said something. It, it was in football practice. They were trying to get out of football practice. That's really what it boiled down to. And it's, you know, why don't we get to decide what we do? And it's like, you know, like, we're American citizens, too. And I said, actually, no, you're not. He said, what do you mean? I said, you're 14. You're a child. You can't vote. You are a ward of the state, right? You are not a citizen. I was like, what does that mean? So your say doesn't matter. <laughs> we don't care. We don't have to, right? We don't have to. And, and I would say if you are a ward or a child mm -hmm. in any capacity, right? We don't have to listen to you. And mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's a serious problem when we're talking about taking away the franchise in any type of sweeping indictment. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's also what made you a, a great uh, youth football coach. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, speak to it. Champions, two years running. <laughs> <laughs> Thank y'all. I love you so much. <laughs> love you too, love you too Anthony. <laughs> Thank you both for your question and your thoughts on this matter. Um, I want to address in the chat a comment from Mr. John Diffley, who's going to be one of our speakers actually later today, our panel at 1 p.m., um, who wrote in the chat, 
Those territories have been historically referred to as possessions. Sure sounds like wardship. Yep. Um, and I also want to go to Francis Riddle's question next. And then um, I think we have time for about one more question after. So if anyone else would like to, okay, I see one in person, um, but from Francis Riddle, we have, I hear myself and others saying happy Juneteenth, but that seems a bit shallow considering the complex history. Any suggestions for appropriate commemorative greetings for the day? Um, I get it. I do. I certainly get that, Francie. Um, like I'm not going to the barbecue today. All right, there's there's several. Um, I'm going. I'm I'm going to, you know, sit and reflect. Um, it's very much a pensive holiday for me in that way. But so is New Year's actually. So is my birthday. Um, I get why folks celebrate. I get why they, you know, they, you know, because they are they're talking about, hey, you know, this is the legal acknowledgement to the freedom. And perhaps that's what people are saying when they are referring to when they're talking about happy Juneteenth. Um, people here on the ground say happy Juneteenth. I get text messages from folks that say happy Juneteenth. Um, I'm gonna let them have it, Francie. I'm, I'm gonna let them have it. I'm not going to challenge their perception. I would just say that for those who are more aware um, if you want to engage in, you know, the, the, the thoughtful work, right. Um, if you want to use the time to reflect and to assess, um, then yeah, you know, I, I see that being appropriate also, um, a word to observe, a word to, to, you know, to replace happy. I don't know. Let me think about that. I'll email you. Um, because, it, you know, because happy Juneteenth, right, with the awareness of the history could be a call to action. Right? If I say happy Juneteenth, I charge you. Oh, okay. All right. I tagged you, Francie. Right? Um, if I say happy Juneteenth, right, I can, I can invoke something in your spirit. Right? Um, because what we say when it's happy Juneteenth is it should be a celebration. It's not, right? For many reasons we can talk about, many that I discussed it in others, right? Right. Um, but it could be a celebration. And so then it then just, you know, warrants other thought work on, okay, well, what can we do to actually make it such? But again, but because it's organic to the community, because this is how folks talk about it in Texas and in, in these spaces of where the great migration has taken people with cultural origins to Texas. I mean, from uh, with or, uh, to Texas, you know, when they talk about it, they say happy Juneteenth. And I won't, I won't take that from them. Yeah. You know, like the issue though, you know, the issue is, and here's my reservation, it becomes cultural appropriation if we do it in, in different terms, if we do it something other than what they do it as. And so it, it has a deeper meaning for us, right? But we're still talking about the same thing. And, and, and I don't wanna take that, right? Because of my, my privilege as an intellectual, right? And my privilege of time to think about these things and, and broader implications, um, at that point, in that moment, I am operating from a different cultural viewpoint. And that's when it becomes appropriation. And I don't wanna do that. Does that make sense? Thank you very much. Um, I do wanna point out a comment from Christian Smith again, uh, who said, one way I think folks could celebrate is saying in commemoration of Juneteenth, what is your Venmo slash cash app or invest in black business? That is a very good question. Yeah, absolutely. There's actually this push down here. I saw, uh, saw it on my IG uh, where folks are reminded, hey, like, yeah, it's a national holiday, but like, 
don't go buy your Juneteenth stuff from Walmart, right? Like, like that's not, you missed it, right? If that, like, if that's what, like you, you know, if, if you at the mall getting your Juneteenth clothes, like you kind of, you know, yeah. I thought that was funny. So you're right. I, I, I like that, Kristen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I believe we had one more question on the ground here at Sturgeon Village. Um, and then I think we will be ending this session. Um, but again, I invite you all to join us for our 1 p.m. panel presentation here on Zoom. Um, additionally, you can send other questions to uh, storo at thebiggie.com and we can facilitate those from there. Storo is S-T-O-R-R-O-W at thebigee.com. Thank you very much. All right. And you can go ahead and ask your question. I guess it's, it's kind of a, 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 a comment. Um, for, for those of you in Zoom land, I am not uh, Black, but my, my wife is. And I'm not <laughs> speaking from her perspective. But it's been very uh, fascinating this past week or two to watch people come up to her or you know, virtually, basically, right? We live pretty sheltered lives, but and say, you know, happy Juneteenth or congratulations on the holiday. And she's like, I didn't celebrate this growing up, you know, being from New York City. Yeah. But not being cynical. I mean, she says that to me. She doesn't say that to yeah. them. No. Yeah. You know, um, but you know, the, the, as you were saying, the, 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 how different groups had different time periods. Is she's all for having you know Juneteenth, but it's just been. I think your talk was a good reminder of all the different uh, segments of America that we have. Right. Um, and the perspectives on this, and I mean, I I, I keep learning more on Juneteenth as the, well. Listening to you, you know, I, I learned a lot. But uh, there's so much diversity within the African American community. I think people forget about right uh, different different places. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't know if they forget about it, Amy. I don't I don't think they acknowledge it. I don't think they know that yeah. we don't go to Black people meetings. I don't I don't think that they know that. Um, you know, like they, you know, the, the conversation about race in the way in which we conflate the term race with culture, right, um, would make it appropriate for people to say happy Juneteenth to somebody growing up, growing up in New York. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the race, right, you know, terminology, which is imposed by the state, places all these groups together for, you know, to, for the purposes of, well, primarily, to facilitate subjugation, right? That's why we are a race, right? Culturally, right? Um, we're very different. So, you know, there were, you know, several conversations I had with the Smith family where me as an Afro-Texan, right? Sitting across the table from, you know, uh, Janae, who is from the Caribbean, and then, you know, with Christian, who's from, whose family is from Virginia to my right, Right. Um, and then uh, to my daughter's mother, who is, you know, mixed race from Texas. <clears throat> and we're having like we're we're talking about things from four cultural viewpoints, even more. Right. Um, and in some instances, because we've all traveled. So, you know, we're learning each other's culture at the same time. Right. Um, yeah. So when we talk about Juneteenth, right, it's. It can be a national holiday, but folks do not call this a black folks holiday because it's not. All right, it, it's simply not. It can become that, right? It can become that if they see value in the, you know, the tenets, if they see value in the implication, right? But that's not an assumption that is fair or appropriate or safe to make, right? In talking to these people, right? Um, it does, yeah, just because they're African American doesn't mean that they celebrate Juneteenth or that they grew up understanding what Juneteenth is. It's just not, it's just not the case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I think that's about all the time we have for uh, this portion of today's speaker series. However, again, I encourage you all to join us in a little less than an hour at 1 p.m. Eastern time for the panel discussion. Um, I want to thank Dr. Guillory again for doing such a wonderful job and um, really facilitating the speaker series and putting us in touch with some wonderful speakers, as well as Vanetta Lightfoot and Stick for their support and enthusiastic contributions. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I wish you all a safe summer. 
um, a happy Father's Day and a happy Juneteenth in whatever sense that means to you and us as a nation. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. It's good seeing you. My pause, mm -hmm. brother. Bye, Janae. Thank you, Anthony. Great right. job. See you at one. All right, we'll see y'all. I'm sorry, I was ready. Hi, Vanetta. <laughs> I see you're still there. I don't know if you are you free to chat, but I just wanted to yeah. say hello and thank you again. Yeah, well, let's. I was never at that. Well, like, Greco did home message.